Hi there. This is Brother Merrill's Inspirational Stories and Sunshine for the Soul. I'm sorry I missed a broadcast on Wednesday. I went down to visit my grandchildren and my daughter and her husband. In Mesa, we had a nice trip, got a lot of sun, and it was hot down there. I have some wonderful stories to share with you today. I wanted to begin with some more stories about Matthew Calley. I, I love Matthew Calley. He had such a casual feel about the way he spoke and the things that he talked about, but he had powerful faith. He was a man of faith. As he was serving in New Zealand one day, a father came up to him in a meeting. As the meeting ended, he said, Brother Cowley, will you give our baby boy a blessing? He's nine months old. And Brother Cowley said, well, why have you waited so long? And he said, we just didn't get around to it. And as Brother Cowley put it, that's kind of the, the Maori way, the Polynesian way. They just kind of go along and they get to things when they get to them. But he said, well, what name do you want? So they told him the name and he said, sure, I'll be happy to do that. As Brother Cowley took the baby in his arms to give him a name and a blessing, the dad said, oh, and by the way, the baby was born blind. If you'd give him his sight while you're giving him a name, that'd be great. <laughs> Brother Callie was shocked, a little taken back, and the dad said, we've taken him to all the specialists, but he was born blind, and they said that's how he'll spend the rest of his life. But you can give him his sight. So I've got to read some of the things he says. This is Brother Callie, and it's hard to imitate his wonderful nature. Well, I was scared. I never had that faith. The thing came to me just suddenly, like lightning out of the blue. But I went on and blessed the baby with the name. It was the longest blessing I think I've ever given. I was using all the words I could think of and had ever heard of. I was trying to get enough inspiration, enough nerve, if you want to call it that, to bless that child with its vision. He did bless him that he would see. Later on, this is how he describes what happened as a result of that blessing. He said, The boy is about 12 years old now. The last time I came back to that area, I was afraid to inquire about him. I was sure he'd gone blind again. That's the way my faith works sometimes. So I asked the branch president about him, and he said, Brother Cowley, that's the worst thing you ever did to bless that child to receive his vision. He's the worst kid in the neighborhood. He's always getting in trouble. Brother Callie said, boy, was I thrilled that that boy was getting into trouble. <laughs> I love Brother Callie. He just had a real matter-of-fact way about him. Another story about someone I've also told stories about is from Parley P. Pratt. When he was called to serve in the Toronto area, he was miraculously blessed with contacts that allowed him to to baptize some of the key individuals in the restoration of the gospel, including John Taylor. But he had made the acquaintance of a good sister, a sister Walton, and she'd allowed him to preach in her home. One day, Sister Walton talked to Parley and said, listen, I have a friend, and she was a school teacher. Her husband died two years ago of cholera, and she's been supporting her family and working hard, but she's developed an eye condition. It's very painful, and she's gone blind. The Methodists in Toronto were actually taking care of this sister and helping support her and her four children. So Sister Walton's daughter took Parley P. Pratt to the lady's apartment. And when they got there, all the blinds were shut, there was hardly any light in the place because light was extremely painful to her eyes. And so Parley P. went in and introduced himself and he said that he was a disciple of Jesus Christ and that he had the priesthood authority that God had restored to the earth. And he explained the restoration of the gospel to her. And she listened and she believed that he could heal her. So he laid his hands on her head she was immediately, immediately healed. This is what Parley P. Pratt said about that experience. I related to her the circumstances of my mission. 
and she believed me. I laid my hands upon her in the name of Jesus Christ and said unto her, Your eyes will be well from this very hour. She threw off her bandages, opened her house to the light, dressed herself, and came to the meeting that we were having at Sister Walton's that evening with eyes as well and as bright as any others. The Methodist community was quite taken by the situation because they knew she was blind and she'd been healed. And they pestered her and they kept asking her, well, what did he do? How did he do it? And they told him, well, he's, he's in with that Joe Smith guy and they're imposters. They don't represent Jesus Christ. And she asked Parley what to do because the Methodist community was just constantly badgering her about what had happened. And he said, give Christ the glory. Tell them that the Lord has made you whole. The next story I want to share with you is from Elder Mark E. Peterson. I remember when he was one of the apostles. I'm sure most people my age do. But he had an amazing experience when he was in a state conference down in California. And a woman came up to him after the meeting. She was the mother of one of the bishops. And she said, Brother Peterson, I'd like you to give Elder Thomas E. McKay a message for me. And he goes, well, that'd be great. What do you want me to tell him? And so she goes, let me, let me see your Book of Mormon. And she took his Book of Mormon and she opened it up and read a paragraph to him. And then she said, two years ago, I was completely blind, but I knew that I could be healed. I had a feeling the Lord would heal me. Elder McKay was down here at a conference, and he and some of the other brethren laid their hands on my head and blessed me that I would receive my sight. It didn't return all at once. I continued to pray, but within a few days, I could see perfectly. Would you please tell Elder McKay, thank you for me. For the last two years, I've been able to read without glasses, as you have just seen me do. Make sure you tell him how much I appreciate it. The next story about restoring the sight of the blind comes from the early 1900s. In 1906, uh, Joseph F. Smith had come to Rotterdam. He made the acquaintance of a young man, John Rotham. John was an 11-year-old boy. His mother was a staunch member of the church. And when he heard that Joseph F. Smith was coming to their town, he knew that he could have his sight restored. And this is what he told his mother. The prophet has the most power of any missionary on earth. If you will take me with you to the meeting, and he will look into my eyes, I believe they will be healed. So the faith of this young man was solid, and his mom, I guess, knew not to argue with him, and she took him to the meeting. And The custom back then was for the visiting authority to go to the back door of the chapel, and then everyone on the way out would shake their hand. It took longer than a meeting sometimes. And so Elder Smith made his way to the back of the building, and as people filed out, he shook their hands and briefly spoke to each one. And as this young boy shook his hand, his eyes were bandaged, and obviously he was suffering a great deal and in a lot of pain. And Elder Smith asked him if he could see his eyes. And they had to have a translator there because Joseph F. Smith was speaking English, and so the young boy concurred, and, and Brother Smith lifted slightly these bandages and just looked sympathetically into his eyes. And then he said something, and the young boy didn't know what he said because it was in English, and the man didn't translate it. And this is what John Rotham says about the experience. I was satisfied that President Smith had acted according to my faith, and according to my faith, it came to pass. When I arrived home, I cried out with joy, Mama, my eyes are well. I don't feel any pain. I can see fine now and far too. 
Following this event, the young boy was able to return to school and enjoyed his eyesight for the rest of his life. I have one more story that I want to share before I conclude, and it's an unusual story, and you have to understand how things used to be in the western United States with the Indians and how the Indians are. They are different than most Anglos understand. And in the middle of the 1900s, a very poor Paiute family had a baby boy that was born stone cold blind. And they were very poor and living out in the desert, scratching out a living. And having a blind child is a huge handicap to an Indian that has to subsist on what he can scratch from the earth. And so when the boy was seven years old, his parents just gave up. And this sounds shocking, but the Anut Indians do this, and so apparently do the Paiutes. They just took him out in the desert and left him to die because they couldn't take care of him. And so for some time, this young boy was surviving alone and scared, thirsty, and hungry, and his animal instincts took over. A passing motorist, a group of tourists, saw this boy just sitting in the desert, and they stopped and took him to the hospital. It took two years to nurse this young man back to health because he was nearly dead when they found him, laying by the side of the road. But he had become an animal. His animal instincts and his fear had just dominated everything about him. And everything was his enemy. He tore apart equipment. He tore apart beds. He tore apart anything that he touched because he just was just an animal. Finally, the hospital farmed him out to a, a boarding school. And they had the same experience with him. The young boy was just uncontrollable. He tore apart record players and desks and paper and pencils and anything that, that he was in contact with. And he, this was uncontrollable. And back at that time, there was a program in the LDS church called the Indian Placement Program. And so the school reached out to a good Latter-day Saint sister, and she agreed to bring this boy into her home. He'd received the name of Michael by that point. She tried to love him. She tried to care for him. He just didn't respond. He just had animal instincts, and he was afraid of everything. But her love slowly helped him come around and feel somewhat secure in that particular environment. Down the road, there was a great young man, and he was a teacher in the Aaronic Priesthood. And by this time... Michael had grown up to be 14 years old. He decided that Michael needed a friend. And so Richard would go spend time with him and visit with him and try to encourage him and be a peacemaker with him and help him feel peace in his life. And then Richard began to save his money because he knew that real peace could come to this Indian boy, if he could read the word of the Lord. So on a trip to Salt Lake, Richard had saved all his money, and he wanted to buy a birthday present for Michael. And he went to the presiding bishop Brick's office, and he asked if he could buy a Braille Book of Mormon. And he only had about half the money he needed, but they heard the situation and thought, no, we need to give this boy a Braille Book of Mormon. And so he presented this Book of Mormon to his friend, Michael. And as Michael would try to read Braille, Richard would help him with the words and read to him. So he learned to read through the Book of Mormon. Elder Victor L. Brown is the one that tells this story, and this is what he says about it. I visited with Michael. He said he had never read such wonderful stories. He said that everything he read in the past was kid stuff, but the Book of Mormon was different. I asked him 
what the greatest desire of his heart was. This 15-year-old Indian boy replied, to become 16 years old so I can be baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He explained that he must wait until his 16th birthday because of the requirement of the Indian agency responsible for him. Michael had his 16th birthday just this August and was baptized by his buddy Richard, who is now a priest. Michael was ordained a deacon in the Aaronic priesthood by his foster father. Michael told his mother that as he was being confirmed a member of the church, the brightest feeling went through his entire body. He said, I now know what white looks like. The Holy Ghost had touched him and let him see the light inside his heart and had borne witness to him of the truth of the gospel. The last school year, Michael, the boy that was incorrigible, was honored for his excellence in school effort and in scholarship and progress, the only boy so honored in his school that year. He hopes someday to teach other blind children as he has been taught. So Michael didn't receive his physical sight, but he received a spiritual insight. It reminds me of Doctrine and Covenants, section 110, verse 1, when Joseph Smith describes the glorious experience that they had when Jesus Christ came to the Kirtland Temple. Most of us just think Christ appeared, but if you read it carefully, Joseph Smith says, The eyes of our understanding were opened, and the Savior stood upon the breastwork of the pulpit. So Christ was already there, but they had to have eyes to see him. Christ is there for all of us, our advocate with the Father. And like Michael's friend Richard, he has already paid the price to help us to come to the Lord. We just need to open the door and let him into our lives. If you are wondering if the Lord will guide you or help you, He will. He will enlighten your mind. He will guide you at critical moments in your life and help you in the ways that you need help. The Lord loves you, and the Lord loves me. It's certainly a privilege to share these stories with you. I have an amazing story coming on Wednesday. A fellow from Idaho that served as a truck driver in Iraq has reached out to me and has shared some amazing stories with me that I'm going to share with you. So stay tuned. This has been Sunshine for the Soul. Please like and subscribe. If you like this story, you might like this one as well. You can listen to all of the Sunshine for the Soul stories here. Thanks again.